Great to have you with us, uh, Jim, CEO of Volvo Cars. You know, you've held many positions before this and quite a few of those in operations and supply chain. Can you tell us more about your career history? Yeah, sure. I actually started my career as an apprentice. So at that particular point in time in the UK, you had the vocational route that you could go through and obviously the standard kind of academic route. And I actually started my career as an apprentice working for a company called Tate & Lyle which was the big sugar manufacturer. And I served the mechanical engineering apprentice. And then obviously after that went to college and so on. But it was a wonderful start for me as a young person because you got to understand the shop floor dynamics at a really early age, if you will. And then from there, I went to Digital Equipment Corporation. That was an operational role. But I think as you go through these different roles, you pick up something a little bit different every time. It's okay. a different industry, it's a different company, you're working with different people and so on. So. I'm an advocate that I think, especially in the early part of your career, moving around a little bit and getting that experience, I think it's been, certainly for me, it was very helpful. And then especially moving into kind of Flextronics and then from there to BlackBerry and then Dyson and now, of course, with Volvo Car. All of those, even at Dyson, I became the chief executive at Dyson as well, but I started in an operational role as a chief operating officer. I did that for like five years and then moved into the CEO role from there. It's been a career which has been steeped in operations, but always with some flavour of different geographies, different industries, and of course, different companies. Absolutely. Has there been sort of one defining moment across your career that you can share with us? I think probably when I joined Flextronics. It was an industry which was quite young. At the time, it was called contract manufacturing. Now it's EMS, Electronic Manufacturing Services. And it was quite a young industry, but it was, even then, was very, very dynamic. And of mm. course, it was growing like, like crazy. I joined Flex when I think there were maybe 800 million in revenue and I was there eight years and by the time I left I think they were approaching 20 billion. A lot of that through acquisition. It was just a great perch upon which to learn about supply chain because what we had in Flex, we had big customers, we had Cisco, we had IBM, we had Motorola, you had all these really big um, hardware companies and we got to see how each one of those ran their supply chain and of course we could cherry pick the best of that and then adapt that towards their own supply chain architecture. So that I think was the defining moment and it's probably where I learned the most in a short period of time. I was just about to ask you, what's the greatest lesson that you've learned in your career? I think things just get a whole lot easier when you can build trust and collaboration in teams. That That's probably one of the single biggest lessons that I learned through that when especially when you're wrestling with really complex issues and it's hard work and people are yeah. working hard and you're facing daily challenges, even today with some of the disturbances and the turbulence that we mm -hmm. see in supply chains today between COVID and, of course, increasing raw materials and inflation and energy security and all that stuff. So it's always there. But I think when you're working as part of a team, if you can build that trust and then that drives collaboration. And what's the best advice that you've ever received from another leader or colleague? There's simply no substitute for hard work. And as they say, hard work beats talent, especially when talent doesn't work hard. So when I'm making choices about people in my team, then I'm looking for people with talent, of course. But that talent gets wasted unless people actually put the effort in. Like I learned that from my dad. My dad had a tremendous work ethic. And I think that I learned that early on. So for me, it was quite natural. You know, like I did paper rounds and milk rounds, yeah. and, you know, and so on. And I think... That's maybe some of the harder things now for some of the young people that they don't have access to those areas to, to build a work ethic early on in life. But de definitely there's no substitute for hard work. And also communication. Learn to be a good communicator, which means be a good listener. What was it that your dad did? My dad was a mechanic, not okay. a car mechanic, but he was a mechanic in a factory. He repaired the production equipment. He would buy old cars and then basically repair them. That was the unwilling apprentice. Has that helped you today? I'm obviously CEO of Volvo, is that something that you've had a bit of experience of then, having had a father as a, a mechanic? So I think just in terms of well, some of those conversations are nothing to do with the actual mechanic or the engineering side of it, but it definitely piqued my interest in, in engineering. So yeah, indirectly, of course. And how has the supply chain field changed since you started your career and what changes do you see coming next? Well, definitely digital. So the digitization of the supply chain is just being able to get access to information quickly and being able to take that data, if you will, and through data analytics process that to give the management team the information that they can act on. The big change, of course, will come 
with the deeper involvement in AI and machine learning. That's really on the horizon. It started already. Yeah. And just as we went through MRP systems and ERP systems and then digitization of supply chains and access to real-time information, now we're going to see predictive AI. Mm. And that's going to be, I think, just going to be fascinating in the next two or three years. Yeah, something you see that's going to disrupt supply chains. And those who invest in it early are going to yield massive benefits around the visibility of the supply chain, getting that first mover advantage when you see material shortages or when you see dynamics changing. But those who don't invest, I think are going to be punished because it's going to be one of these game-changing technologies that uh, that will make a real difference. Just talking a little bit more about Volvo. So Volvo's purpose is to offer people the freedom to move in a safe, sustainable and personal way. That's one of the reasons as to why you said that you want to be a pure electric car maker by 2030. Can you tell us how you are reducing emissions across the board and what role digital digitization and technology must play in that? Mm -hmm. Well, we took the company public a, a, about 18 months or so ago. Um, and one of the things we said we would get done is that we'd be a full electric car company mm -hmm. 2030, that we'd be halfway there by 25, but also that we would reduce our CO2 emissions by 40% on a baseline of 2018. The quickest way in which to reduce our CO2 emissions is obviously to turn the fleet into all electric. That's the biggest single lever that we have. But then the choice of materials that we use, and we're still using steel and aluminium, of course, from a crash protectiveness, we need those materials. But the way in which those materials are now processed, trying to use as much green steel as possible, mm -hmm. as much green aluminium as possible, as much recycled plastics, and then the full circularity is still quite in its infancy right now globally. But we're, I think we're pioneers in at least thinking about how we can take that to the next level. So one of the things I did pretty recently was that to give that sustainability a, a wider voice, then I moved the sustainability team to report directly to me. And that was picked up, I think, throughout externally to the company. But there was a big message in that internally as well, that the sustainability reports directly to the CEO, therefore, de facto, were definitely taking this serious. And of course, as the CEO, you have those resources at your disposal. People on that, we need different talent, we need to make more investments. Then, of course, there's the direct link to me as the CEO at yeah. that point in time. And so we're looking for suppliers who really understand the movement towards sustainability and circularity. Mm -hmm. We're looking for digitization so we can have visibility across the entire supply chain. And we're looking for new technologies that help drive that forward as well. And this is the thing with sustainability. There's not one thing. It's a hundred small things that really add up to make the difference. You know, obviously zero one hundred is about... 0% carbon, 100% digital supply chain. Is that why the mission has appealed to you in terms of the focus that you have on sustainability and the focus that you have on digitization and tech? Is this something that's really resonated with you as a community? Yeah, I, th I know quite a few of the people that's involved in the company and I have, I have tremendous respect for them. So there was partly, well, who's the team? Because everything starts with the talent, you know, and who's that team of people that want to go make a difference? What's their mission? And a lot of the people I know that are involved in, in Zero Hundred are mission-driven people. And then, of course, it, it says it. <laughs> it says <laughs> as a company, zero percent yeah. carbon and one hundred percent digital. I think is a uh, is a very good framework for where supply chains should be heading in the future. What are the interventions to be made and milestones to be hit to deliver Zero One Hundred uh, supply chains? In your view, there's going to be investment. Technology is usually one of the major enablers. Whether that technology is digital technology and digitization, visibility across the supply chain, but really understanding scope three, and then the, the underlying technologies that allow us to get those new materials that are less carbon intensive, to design different ways of working, different ways of assembly process, and then of course the energy part to that, how we yeah. can use much more renewable energies in the manufacturing processes of the raw materials themselves, but also the finished products. Do you see any industries that are moving quicker than others? For me, the biggest part, the other, maybe the bigger story here is like, who are the people that have got a really good plan to get to where they want to go? And in some cases, that's going to take longer. It's going to be much harder. It's going to be a steeper climb. There's going to be more investment than in some other industries. We're really starting to see some momentum now because we start to see the investor community looking at investments in companies that are authentically moving in the right direction, so sustainability. And I think that's a positive sign. Great. And um, what's the number one thing supply chain leaders should be doing right now from your point of view? And what should they be looking out for next? Well, it's all about building resilience. So I've certainly been working in supply chain for a long time. The pandemic and brought it into very, very sharp focus over the last two years. And so now supply chain has become very topical, which is good. It gives it visibility. 
Hopefully we'll start to see a lot more CSCOs getting a seat at the table so that they can talk to senior management and even to the board about the big challenges that supply chains face. Part of that will be resilience, of course, and building that resilience. Just in time, manufacturing processes are, I think they're gone. I don't think they're coming back soon. So how do you then build a resilience in your supply chain across that entire network? And how do you do it in such a way where it's visible so you know if there's going to be a breakage in the supply chain, where that's going to occur? How do you use AI in order to predict those potential weak spots in the supply chain, you know, and then how do you build a global supply chain that works together? Because we're moving now much more to regional supply chains, so in region for region. I think that's the biggest change that we're, we're seeing on top of digitization and the use of AI tools and stuff. Yeah. The actual architecture of supply chains is moving towards in region for region, opposed to build in the east and sell to the west. Got it. Well, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. You bet. This episode of Radical Reinvention was produced by Catherine Perry, Brian Egan, Ursuline Kahn, Diane Hope, Nick Heineman, Duda Rodriguez, and me, Victoria Marin. Ko Takasugi Chernovin composed our theme music. To find out more about Zero 100 and to check out our content library, go to zero100.com. If you're interested in joining our community of contributors, send us a note at hello at zero100.com. At